is a KETV News Watch 7 breaking news update. And good afternoon, everyone. We are about to get an update on the condition of the Massachusetts doctor hospitalized in Omaha with the Ebola virus. Dr. Rick Saker has been at the Nebraska Medical Center since last Friday. Just yesterday, we saw the first photo of him since his hospitalization here. Saker is seen on the video screen right there with his wife, Debbie, reading Bible verses to him. The photo taken by the couple's son, Max. I want to go live now to the Nebraska Medical Center where Chancellor Gold is introducing the speakers today. The immediate response team of countless volunteers, I too stood on the soil at Ground Zero exactly 13 years ago today. We as a country and we as a healthcare professional system will never forget and are continually strengthened and empowered by those memories. I would like to thank all of you for being here today, and I'd also like to thank you for all of the respect that you've shown to the healthcare professionals uh, and to the family. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the amazing teamwork that has taken place from everybody at all levels of our organization and the organizations uh, with which we work. The cooperation between the medical professionals, the staff members from UNMC, the University of Nebraska Medical Center has been top notch. This demonstrates again and again that we are truly one healthcare organization. The dedication we've seen has been truly remarkable. Everyone has jumped in to lend a special hand. The answer has always been yes, no matter who we have asked, no matter what time of the day or night it has been. I'd also like to extend a big University of Nebraska thank you to all of the government officials uh, in Washington, in Omaha, in Douglas County, uh, in the state of Nebraska offices in Lincoln, whose partnership has been absolutely uh, invaluable, as have those at Emory and the CDC uh, and others. But most of all, I personally, and as the leader of this great institution, would like to thank uh, Dr. and Mrs. Sacra and their family for entrusting us with the care and the courage to work with us throughout this entire episode. It has really been a pleasure to work with you and I am honored to meet you and to be part of the healthcare team. The Sacred Family has gotten a great dose of Nebraska niceness, and let me tell you, they have returned it in many, many different ways. It's now a great pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, Mrs. Debbie Sacred. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming and for the continuing concern for Rick as he recovers from Ebola virus disease. As we've released information each day, you've seen that he is steadily improving. We're so appreciative also of the attention and professionalism of the biocontainment unit team here at the Nebraska Medical Center. We've been cared for on every level by the physicians, the nurses, the administrators, everyone at this great institution. Nebraska really should be proud. <laughs> we really are amazed at how quickly Rick's condition seemed to turn around after he was admitted on, fr on Friday. As his friend Kent Brantley said on national TV that very night, we attribute his recovery also to both faith and science. Rick asked me to say that he is humbled and overwhelmed by the words of kindness and support that he has received since his diagnosis with Ebola virus disease. Our old friends from years past, new friends whom he has not met, and long time, a long list of those who have supported our mission work for over 25 years have all joined in a mighty chorus of prayer on his behalf. These prayers have made him know that God is near and they have sustained him. We thank God for his mercy in preserving Rick's life and we are also thankful for the research drug and excellent supportive medical care that was available because he could be evacuated. Most of all, we hope that what is learned from Rick's and his colleagues' illnesses 
can open up viable possibilities for the treatment of Ebola in West Africa, where the suffering is now extending far beyond the victims of the virus itself. Rick went to Liberia at the beginning of August because he could see that the Ebola crisis was setting off a domino effect in the Liberian healthcare system. Not only was there inadequate health care, inadequate medical care for those with Ebola disease, but patients with common health problems were not getting treatment. His patients with high blood pressure would not be filling their prescriptions, those with diabetes would not be getting their blood tests, and the parents and parents were going to lose their small children to malaria because there was no place where they could get the IV drugs they needed. When Rick arrived at the beginning of August, there was not one box of, of rubber gloves, of latex gloves, to be purchased in the entire city of Monrovia. So clinics and hospitals really almost had no choice but to close their doors until some protective equipment could be available to them. Rick himself had to go all around the city to hardware stores to find boots with which he could supply his obstetrics and his OR staff so they could be protected in that way when they were doing their work. The first week the hospital opened for obstetrics only they received a dozen women who had been to multiple hospitals after long and unsuccessful labor, labor and none were able to get a cesarean section at those places. By the time these women arrived at our hospital, only the mother's lives could be saved. Rick was really heartbroken. Now I know, I know I'm speaking a bit long and you have a lot of questions you want to answer, ask, excuse me. But we want people to understand what is really happening in Liberia. We appreciate all the attention and concern for Rick, but he wants you to share his burden for the people of Liberia and West Africa to carry it along with him. We appreciate that many have given to our mission and many other organizations to make sure that health workers have protective equipment. But the fight against this crisis is going to take more time and resources. We in America enjoy many benefits from globalization and we'd like to think that we can isolate ourselves from a situation like this, like the one in Liberia. But every day, and every week that we don't do what we can to stop Ebola in West Africa, we are risking the possibility that Ebola will not stay in West Africa. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess we're going to take some questions. And uh, I, uh, I, mean, I don't really know how to, to manage this. <laughs> I'm <more laughs> okay. All right. You are aware, and I'd like the doctors if they could chime in on this as well, but first you, um, NBC News recently broke the news that um, Rick received a blood donation from Dr. Brantley, um, and I guess I'm wondering what that means to you to have him here, and what it meant to your husband, and the doctors if they could address, address the medical mm -hmm. uh, issues surrounding him. Um, well, uh, I didn't get to see Kent. He was here before I got here. and. Um, uh, it really meant a lot to us that he was willing to give that donation so soon after his um, re own recovery. And uh, I spoke with his wife before it was arranged, and um, we both marveled at the, the fact that they had the same blood type. Th that was just, to us, that was uh, something from the Lord. Um, however, since they're so alike, we often thought that they were. <laughs> um, but uh, they can speak to any of the other medical issues. Before we get yeah. to the medical, could you say how Rick reacted to heaven? Um, I, he, he was blessed. He didn't find out till um, he was not able to like interact with Kent when he was here. But um, the uh, but he was blessed and, and you know felt the same way we did when we found out it was a match. It was pretty it was pretty special. So. Yeah. <coughs> This is a form of therapy called convalescent therapy. Convalescent transfusion plasma was taken from a donor who had recovered, therefore presumably had antibodies against the virus that Rick had not yet had time to develop. 
and two separate transfusions were harvested and given with, with no difficulty whatsoever. So in the absence of proven theories, uh, uh, proven antivirals for Ebola, we thought we wanted to try everything we could and, and that worked out very well. The first donor we tested was a mismatch and, and we were down to our last shot, so we said, uh-oh, but it uh, worked out great. Yeah, we were blessed. Another question? Uh, just in follow up, um, I know there, we've heard talk about experimental treatments. This is not that experimental treatment. There's another experimental treatment being used. Yes, there's another experimental treatment that's been given as well, and we've been asked not to release the name for a number of reasons. One is we have no data. Uh, some of our blood tests have been sent to the CDC for analysis, so hopefully in the relatively near future, uh, we'll have some information. Right. Um, so he was in Liberia, and it was Labor Day weekend, Friday night. So that would be the 29th, right? And he uh, actually, I don't think he told me that night. I think Saturday morning he told me that he had been running a fever, and he was worried um, that he was treating himself for malaria. Uh, just in case and, 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 and in, in, in hope that that's what it was. Uh, but after, and we were texting and talking a little bit, but mostly just in, um, messaging one another all weekend, monitoring the fever, um, discussing, you know, uh, the, th the events of the week, I guess. And uh, we were scared. We were scared uh, what it might be. He spoke to the boys on Monday afternoon while he was waiting to get his test. He couldn't test until Monday morning because um, you often have a negative if you do it too soon. And so he had to wait until Monday to test. And they came and took his blood. And uh, he later in the afternoon, he's saying, this has been the longest day of my life, waiting to hear. Um, so. He had chills and fever a lot over the weekend, took some Tylenol to try and could at least be comfortable. And especially all weekend, he was, um, he was making sure he was staying hydrated with uh, homemade oral rehydration serum, or uh, what you call it? Solution. Solution, that's the word. <laughs> and um, which he's a big fan of when there's, you know, when you've got uh, problems. And that, I think, um, the doctors felt that really helped him when it uh, came time to, when he arrived, that his electrolytes were, were manageable. And uh, so, uh, so it was scary, and, but I think that when he went away at the beginning of August, we had already discussed that this could happen. I think I had faced my worst fears when he left. <laughs> and, um, and we were, uh, we were, I was very hopeful, I would say. Um, I think my, my brother-in-law called it optimistic denial <laughs> um, because they were having survivors at the treatment center in Monrovia. And um, not that they necessarily really know what the secret is to why some people are surviving and some people are not, but, um, but I think I was in a really different place than than the Brantleys, where they had already, I mean, they had seen almost only one survivor, I think, when Kent had gotten sick. And so, uh, so I think that I had a little bit of, and, and I'm maybe a little bit more of an optimist than I should be, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I was thankful. I was really thankful when the evacuation could happen so quickly. Um, the earlier one took so long. That um, that it was kind. Of, it all happened so fast. I think we hardly had time to be too afraid. So I just wanted to add that uh, Rick has been greatly helpful to us as a physician going through this disease. We don't know much about it, but he's, he's able to now very clearly articulate what symptoms he had, when, and what the timing was. So we're learning not just by watching him and treating him, but also by his. Uh, 
description is because he's a physician, so he's he's helped us back. <laughs> He said it was Friday evening the 29th was when he first began to have a fever um, in the, you know, just above 100, I think. And uh, I think it was Sunday when it finally got over what they consider probable for Ebola. I don't know if it's 101.5 or 102, something like that. Yes. Hi. Um, well, I guess just being thankful and knowing, I think more than anything, um, just knowing that this is going to be a platform, a platform for him to um, be able to speak out on behalf of the people who are suffering over there and who, um, you know, quite frankly, were ignored for the first six weeks that this was going on. And um, I know that, that uh, he would hate all this attention, but if he can, if he can use it to make sure that, uh, that resources are used well in Liberia and in Sierra Leone and Guinea to um, help lick this thing and build up the healthcare system so that he, so that um, they're not at risk of this kind of uh, disaster again, that he will, um, he will do everything he can from here on out to make sure that that's true. You know, he would say, this is not about me. This is about getting the job done. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Chase on with a local NBC. Tell me about, you mentioned in your statements about the mission to to really bring the medicine to the area. Talk about where, have you been able to talk about the current state of helping this outbreak in terms of where it stands? And where you guys you know, I'll be honest with you, since this all happened, I'm pretty out of touch sure. with what's going on there. The only um, thing that I can tell you is that I got, so when Rick got sick, um, one of the doctors uh, who had taken care of uh, Nancy Wrightball and Kent Brantley uh, he had come to the States, he had rested, and he was ready to go back. Um, and he, uh, he got on the next plane, I believe, out of there and arrived before Rick had evacuated and he, in fact, helped Rick get in the ambulance and get to the plane. Um, so the idea is he picked up where Rick was leaving off, basically, and they were... Um, they were redesigning the uh, intake area of the hospital so that they could um, especially begin to see pediatric patients and get them on the ward if they needed to be. Um, but they needed a, a stricter triage system. And so Rick had designed that the week before. I got an email this morning from Dr. John Fankhauser that um, they were finishing up the, the construction work on that today. So hopefully um, by next week they will be able to um, get that in place. But there's just a whole new set of procedures and um, uh, ways of doing things that they have to come up with to protect themselves um, from uh, exposure. So, um, so that's, that's all I really know at this time. <laughs> Do you think he knows how we got it yet? Um, you know, I knew that question was going to come up. He, uh, and here's my answer. <laughs> um, it was investigated by a team in Liberia. Um, I think a CDC team uh, is investigating exposures and such. Uh, I, I honestly do not have details about what they found out and what they figured out. Um, they do believe, I'll say this, they do believe it happened at the hospital in an emergency situation, but up to this point, no other hospital staff have become sick. So. Um, I don't know. So that's all I can offer you on that detail. Two-part question. First, doctor, the term steadily improving has been used. Is uh, there a chance of a relapse or is this pretty much a uh, it will consi consistently being steadily improving until uh, uh, he's cured? Well, I, I 
think we're on, on new ground here. Um, I would say that given his remarkable improvement over the last few days, I would think a relapse would be less likely. But again, since this is a completely new situation, he is different from the patients at at Emory, he's different from any other patient, essentially, in the fact that he's received um, this investigational drug along with the, the convalescent Sarah. So, um, so there's really no way to tell, but I can tell you his progress has been uh, remarkable. And, uh, Sarah, if your husband, as a wife, if your husband says he wants to go back, what will you tell him? I'll probably say the same thing I said when he went the first time, and that is, I know where your heart is. And, and besides, now <laughs> he'll have immunity. <laughs> so, but I'm sure that when he gets his strength back, he's going to be um, ready to go back. And I think that I will have to allow that. So he's, it's where his heart is. He loves Liberian people. He loves Liberia. He loves taking care of the old people. He loves taking care of the babies. He loves joshing with the young men and the young people. He's... Uh, they say that he is a Liberian with white skin. So. <laughs> Can you talk about what it was like to be able to communicate with him and see him for the first time coming here to Omaha? It really, um, you know, yes, I got choked up doing that because uh, the last, I, he went into the unit on Monday night and I talked to him on the phone as he was waiting to enter. They were preparing his bed and such. And um, Tuesday morning, I, um, I think I heard from him by email or text or something, and then I did not hear anything for, I think, for a, till the next morning, I think they, the mission had heard that he had had a rough day on Tuesday. And, but I didn't hear his voice. I didn't get a message all the way through through Tuesday, through Wednesday. I think he finally called sometime on Wednesday and he had about three minutes worth of energy to, call, to talk. In fact, I was on another call and he called and my son answered it and, and uh, talked to him for a minute and then, he, and then my son said, Dad says you better hurry. <laughs> He's not going to have much, not going to be able to talk long. So, uh, and then on Thursday, I heard from him um, as they were starting to get him ready to uh, suit up for the evacuation, just a text message, and, and then Dr. Frankhauser called me after he was on the plane. So, um, so we, those days were really pretty rough with no, they were busy because I had news media outside my door all day, but, um, but they were hard to not hear from him. And uh, so those, you know, it would, it was nice that over the weekend we were in good contact, but it was a little scarier after he was sicker, obviously. So you so. said you got choked up thinking about that. You also got choked up when you started reading the statements about um, his condition. I know that people, when they watch loved ones recovered, they have certain milestones. Since Friday, can you kind of give some of the milestones that you've seen emotionally and in the life? When, when we first talked via the teleconference, he was, um, he was very pale. His eyes were red. Um, he did not have a lot of energy. It was really just more that he wanted to see my face. This was Saturday, so. Um, and I was happy to see his face. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when, at, later on in the evening, the second teleconference, he says, you talk, because <laughs> he didn't even have the energy to say anything. Um, but every single day, um, you know, the first two or three days he was very slow, slow to respond, slow to, um, to get his words together, to say something. Um, he was quite emotional. Uh, I would tell him things that happened, you know, things that people were saying and he would get pretty, you know, emotional about it. Uh, then, I mean, as Dr. Smith said to me this morning, it seems like his brain is waking up a little bit more every day because, um, you know, even they could see, I think it was, let's see, today is Thursday. So Tuesday they said he was sharing all his notes with them, um, to tell, you know, talking about the course of the disease. And uh, t this morning when I talked to him, I would say he was uh, mentally, like, 
just really, you know, much more his usual self, especially in that sort of Skyping context. You know, it's always a little awkward and strange. So, um, right. I think uh, the ma their main goal right now is to get him to eat more. He um, has not, he's had a lot of, uh, some of it has been stomach upset, but more of it has just been things taste funny and not, or the texture is funny. So, uh, so the goal really in the next couple of days, I think, is to get him to find things he can eat so that he is uh, eating more normally and, and get some calories. Um, so. You said earlier in the week, or you reported earlier in the week, saying that you had a, a rough uh, reaction to that experimental drug and then it, it's gotten better since then. Yeah, I think yeah. it's fair to say the first, he, he was sicker, so it's hard to know for sure what was responsible. Uh, and you electrolyte abnormalities, fluid problems, and and, we, and that's the time we were administering his medication. So uh, we have, it's hard to know what caused what, but he uh, seemed to be tolerating each dose subsequently better, and he lately has had no reaction to it. We're giving it to him, yes, roughly. There's, there was two occasions, two separate occasions, Dr. Brantley's blood. Oh, it had it had no effect. It's like he, he was eating chicken soup. <laughs> well, I think what we're hoping it jump started his immunity. So the this is a, a very serious viral infection, and to survive, you have to build up enough antibodies to neutralize the virus. And since most people don't survive, they it, the virus multiplies faster than the immune system can respond. But uh, we're hoping to buy him some time. And I, in other words, give antibodies to help him, his immune system get started battling the Ebola virus and uh, let him get ahead of the curve. So there again, he seemed to respond nicely to those and so certainly tolerated them. Uh, I don't know how much of his recovery is due to the drug, how much is due to the uh, convalescent serum, and how much is due to aggressive IV fluids and other medications to help him. Uh, certainly the, we want to thank the critical care of medicine anesthesia team was spectacular with uh, taking care of a very sick person. We have some folks listening in on the phone and we'd like to turn things over to them if they would uh, like to pose any questions. So feel free to do so now. Michelle Cortez from Bloomberg. I'm wondering if you guys could identify yourselves first and then tell us what the treatment effect or, or what the, the treatment has been. We're kind of getting some crunchy information through the phone. We can't hear it exactly. It sounds like maybe some blood transfusions from Dr. Brantley and then, uh, then an experimental medication, wondering how often he got that and um, what type of fluids and whatnot. Thanks. Um, so this is Dr. Angela Hewlett. I can tell you that he received uh, two doses of convalescent sera from Dr. Kent Brantley. He's received an experimental drug um, for every night, actually, um, for the last several days since his arrival. And he's also been receiving a lot of what we call aggressive supportive care, and that is IV fluids, uh, nutrition, um, supplements for his uh, electrolytes in his, in his blood, things like potassium, phosphorus, things like that that are important to maintain uh, the sort of integral functions of the body, cardiac function and such. Um, and, uh, and essentially what we've been doing now is just supporting him through this. Can you follow up to that? What signs will they be looking for to decide whether or not to have Dr. Brody back um, to have that another treatment? And, and the follow-up also the medical treatment? Um, well, let me, I'll take that, for, this Dr. Phil Smith. First of all, uh, the milestones are, are clinical, laboratory, and, and, and others. So, for instance, we're hoping to have data back from the CDC uh, on our how much virus, how much Ebola virus he had in his blood at certain times through his hospitalization, and that'll help us in seeing how he does clinically. And as I mentioned, I've been asked not to disclose by several uh, parties, not to disclose the, the drug, I think, for a variety of reasons. One is that we don't have the data yet. There is very little short supply. We don't want them to create a, 
uh, feeling that this is a, a cure-all. We don't know whether this drug had any impact at all. Um, it might have. Uh, he, he certainly he got better, but he got plasma. He got aggressive resuscitation. So we we think it'd be premature to uh, speculate about whether that what the drug is and what uh, its effect was. Could you talk a little bit about the effort to document the treatment and get data? And, you know, say you're in new territory, and, and what are you doing to figure out if any of this helps and maybe help future patients? Well, that's a good question. There, these dr new drugs all have r rigid protocols that the FDA enforces, and so they all have. Uh, require extensive testing of blood parameters so we can see, for instance, if any kidneys are injured or liver is injured or there's anemia or any side effects. We're also measuring the amount of virus in the blood and uh, uh, other tests like that and biological markers that will help us decide uh, whether it was uh, effective or not. But it sounds like it would be difficult to tell uh, of the treatments you're doing which had an effect or how much of an effect was from the blood transfusion. You know, that's legitimate criticism, but we decided uh, we're more interested in, in saving Rick than trying to have a pure study, so we just ad administered everything we could, we had access to, basically. And uh, I th we're hoping that our experience plus the Emory experience with ZMAP uh, will begin to pool enough information that we can start to get an idea about which drugs could be effective. We're reassessing that on a daily basis, um, and, and it's really going to depend on his progress. Uh, right now, we're encouraged by his progress, and as you've heard from, from Debbie and Dr. Smith, that, that he is doing a lot better clinically and on paper uh, in his lab work and lab parameters. But, but again, we're, we're really taking things day by day here, and, and I think that this is, um, as I said, sort of a brave new world, and he is his own patient and different from all the others, and so we really have to, uh, have to assess on a daily basis on, on uh, our various therapies, including the investigational drug. Uh, no, we, again, that's laboratory data we don't have back yet, but that's uh, the in information. So at some point, in the, in the case of the patients at Emory, who uh, may be different than Rick, uh, it was uh, two, almost two weeks from now before they were able to say that the blood had cleared completely of the virus, and then they released the patients. Uh, he may do it faster, he may do it slower, we're not sure. Uh, Right. I would say he he started the first day was pretty rocky. You, you weren't here for that. You did. Yeah, good I thing. missed that day. <laughs> I was stuck in Chicago uh, uh, that night. <laughs> that's just as well you missed that. But uh, then the second day it was. Uh, uh, enough better that we were, it was not, uh, we still had some abnormalities, certain tests and organ systems and so forth. And then the third day, I think maybe, is the day that we started saying, well, just we really like the way this is going, and each day has been picked up. Uh, we, we, Dr. Uh, Hewlett had the benefit of talking directly to one of the physicians in uh, Africa about their experience. Obviously, they don't have the treatments we do, but they take care of a lot of patients. and. Uh, physicians who treat Ebola have, have talked about a uh, honeymoon phase where the patient looks good and then later on they deteriorate markedly. So we've been, that's why we're a little guarded. And we, we, we don't anticipate that happening, but um, we are being careful about it. Do you have anything to add on that? I will say that the physicians in Africa, though, don't have anything to go with that honeymoon phase. They have no lab work. They have no parameters like what we've seen. And so we don't, they, they can say that clinically that's what they've observed. And clinically we've observed him improve on a day-to-day -day basis, but we also have lab parameters to go with that. Um, and those are also showing improvement, which is very encouraging. At what point would it be No, I had phone conversations with the CDC, and they've got some very rigid guidelines. You need a PCR test to, to be uh, negative, meaning there's no virus in the blood, and you need, need two tests uh, at least 48 hours apart. 
that are completely negative before a patient's considered cured and non-infectious. Now, if he, if he didn't have Ebola, if he had the flu, uh, we'd, we might send him home earlier. Uh, I could imagine a scenario where he'd, he'd be well enough that he, uh, with a little bit of home nursing, we could send him home in a couple of days maybe. Uh, uh, but uh, b because of the disease we're dealing with, the CDC has pretty much told us that we have to meet these markers in order to release him. So I think he's going to get pretty restless. <laughs> yes, but um, people in hospitals can get infections from IVs or catheters and uh, other things. So it protects you from external infections, certainly, but not from internal ones. Hold his hand. Yeah, that's hard. That's really hard. But, you know, when you weigh it in the balance of the fact that he's alive, you, he, you can put it aside. <laughs> so. Um, so, on, let's see, I guess it was Monday night. He was, that was the first time he was able to talk with uh, the two, our two sons who are in Massachusetts. And, um, and then last night he was able to talk with his brother and uh, um, his father, his elderly father. So. For the doctors, I just got, a, I just got an email from uh, Dr. Nancy Snyderman's producer asking what you did to Dr. To Dr. Brantley's blood to make it this year. So was it a straight donation? Yeah, it was a straight donation. We went through the blood bank here and we tracked him down to blood typing and then they collect whole blood and then uh, through a filtering process get rid of the red cells, red blood cells, so you have plasma. And we transfuse plasma. So Nancy wasn't a match, right? Yes. So you tried her first? Well, we, we, yes, we did because uh, we, we, had, we said uh, we're looking for all the help we could get and we were able to get hold of her first. Actually, SIM was very helpful at locating these people and helping to find out their blood types. They had a lot of information already. So. How much, how much time passed from when Kenneth gave his blood to when he was in Dr. Oh, I'd say it was a matter of um, hours to minutes to hours for the first dose, and then the second dose we gave the next day. And that was Saturday? Yes. <clears throat> We gave it was a Friday or Saturday. We gave, we gave it Saturday. But he was Saturday here. And Sunday. He was. He here. arrived Friday, and then that's right. We got the the first unit was Saturday, and the second unit was Sunday. Did that blood donation show high levels of antibodies for the Ebola virus? Were you able to test it, Dr. Bradley's blood? Or no, no, we did not. We did, we didn't have time for that, so we we just presumed we knew it was compatible. It would be safe to transfuse. And we, t we talked to Debbie and we talked to Rick and we said there's always some risk with the transfusion and we don't have time to run the tests on, on levels of antibody, but uh, chances are good that there's going to be some significant amount of anti-Ebola antibody in there. So you do follow-up That's a project we're working on with the Emory people, trying to create a list of who's got what blood type and, and who could potentially... Donate. Yes, definitely, uh, very closely, on a daily, if not more than more than that basis. <laughs> we, we've noticed that that's been a, a big part of this disease is the electrolyte imbalances that occur, and 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 electrolyte imbalance can lead to a lot of severe complications. And and in Africa, they don't have the ability to test for those things, so we, we don't really know um, what, what goes on as far as how high the potassium or low the potassium level is and how low the magnesium level are, are and that sort of thing. So here we have that ability, and so we're able to monitor those electrolytes and replace them as needed. Mostly cardiac problems, uh, cardiac uh, arrhythmias, uh, irregular heart rate, things like that, which could be a, a big factor in this disease. It's not something that we know a lot about, um, but uh, again, because they can't, they can't monitor that sort of thing in, in Africa. But, but here, we've been able to monitor him very closely and, and give him what he needs so that we avoid those problems. I want to check back with the folks on the phone to see if there are any uh, questions there before we start to wrap things up here. Hello? Yeah. Feel free to ask any questions. 
Um, I was wondering, could you just sum up um, from a medical point of view um, what his condition is now? I mean, we've heard bits and pieces throughout this conversation, but it would be nice to sum up where he is. And, and, and a second little question is, on what basis is this uh, experimental drug being given? Is it a, a, an, an individual experimental IND, or, or how, how is that arranged? Yeah, any, any drug you give has to go through an IND, in this case, emergency IND. Um, and all that just means is a drug that has shown promise in the test tube and promise in animals, but it hasn't been thoroughly tested. Uh, it, and in the case of some of these drugs, they've been able to get into human volunteers to, to look at safety. Um, as far what was the other question? His, as far as his condition goes, I can tell you that he's been improving on a day-to-day -day basis. We initially said he was stable, which means that his vital signs are stable. Um, uh, however, that has improved significantly over the last few days. I would say he's in, he's in good condition at this point. Um, he is able to maintain some, uh, some food intake, and uh, he is able to, to get up and move around his room and communicate um, and uh, read uh, magazines and, and really getting back to, to his normal self. He's not able to take in enough calories to support himself by mouth, so he has a, he's being fed through an IV. And he tires easily, and, yeah. and he, you know, he's weak. Yesterday, they set up um, an exercise bicycle for him to try and get some physical activity. Um, and uh, he, he did it, well, he, they had like a chair set up so it was recumbent. He did it for 10 minutes yesterday and today he, he told me that that was overdoing it. So this is someone who could, who could ride between 15 and 35 miles a couple times a week uh, at the end of July. So uh, he's definitely lost physical condition since then. So I think that'll take a while to come back. We're going to start to wind things down, maybe three or four more questions. You said he had a rough trip over from, from Liberia. What, what sort of thing? He was able to walk onto the plane, but then he, he was taken out by Liberia. Um, all I know is that they had to sedate him. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not an easy trip when you're okay. <laughs> so um, they said that he got restless, and, and uh, so they had to sedate him. So I, I don't have... Um, de a lot of details on that, but. Oh yes, a great sense of relief, but um, just grateful, so grateful to um, the Nebraska Medical Center for how well they've taken care of him and uh, just how invested they've become in his recovery. Uh, Grateful to God for answering the prayers of so many people um, and burdened that this not really just be our own story, but a story of ourselves and uh, our people in Liberia as well. So. Debbie, we have seen the first picture of you and Dr. Zaker kind of communicating through the video conference. Oh, yes. Yep. You know, what verses you're reading, what the reading I'm sure the, the um, let's see, I think the first day I read Psalm 20, which was a, um, a psalm that the Lord put on my heart. It was one of those, you know, open your Bible and this is what you read days. <laughs> and, um, and that is what came up, and it seemed to, ex you know, s really speak to me. Um, John 14 was uh, the teaching at my church on the Sunday that I knew that Rick was sick, but we weren't really telling anyone. And there were um, some verses in that, uh, I think Christ said, uh, you, because I live, you will live. And it was, you know, it just seemed to touch me. Um, but there were other verses in that as well. And then yesterday, I read um, Philippians 1 and 2. And... Uh, that is, I, some of that uh, had been on my heart when I gave my press conference last, uh, last week. And uh, I, I used some passages from that. So those have been where I keep going back to myself. So I was sharing those with him. So. 
So those are mine, not necessarily his favorites. He hasn't, he hasn't said, oh, please read this. So, um, so I, had, I got to have my own ideas about what to read this week. This will be the last one. Doctors, you know that Emory University helped you and taught you things about treating Ebola. With this patient, are there things on that you have learned that they didn't know that you can help them with their education? Yes, we've been on the phone. Uh, they've been very helpful. They, uh, I called them daily for the first several days before Rick showed up. We knew he was coming and uh, frequently throughout his, his stay. And they have another patient now. They've called us and been in contact. In fact, one of their nurses is going to visit later in the year. So it's, there's been a, a mutual exchange and uh, trying to figure out a number of lessons learned in, in terms of treatment and complications. And uh, I think by, the only way we'll do this is by pooling our data, because this is so far the limit of the experience of uh, Ebola care in the U.S. I'm sorry, Taylor, just a quick procedure. I, I just wondered, if, uh, am I correct that Dr. Bramley and Dr. Carver were able to talk to the video conference? No. no, they were not, because, I mean, they tried, but Rick doesn't remember it. <laughs> he doesn't remember that they did that, uh, because Rick was so out of it. So I think, I think Kent, I wasn't here, but I think Kent spoke to him and told him that he was praying for him, but I don't think that, but Rick does not remember that he was here. He said, was Kent here? <laughs> so, uh, oh, I'm, I, I'm sure they will. So, I'm sure they will. They're very close. So, um, you know, I wanted to just clarify something about the Bible readings that I read and what I quoted, and that is that I really want to say that, um, you know, the things are, that are in those Bible verses, they could, they, you could read them as though they are, you know, so rock solid promises about living a physical life. But I think that really for us, that they were an assurance that no matter what happened in the situation, that, that, that there was still life. So I just, I don't want anyone to misconstrue because, you know, a lot of people are not living as a result of this and uh, so we uh, we thank God for Rick's life and uh, we know that uh, that Rick will do something good with with the life that he's given um, but uh, we are mourning for all of those who are losing loved ones um, as a result of this terrible virus so thank you Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. We will uh, continue to keep we, keep everyone posted as we have uh, the last few days with daily emails. But I, I think the news yeah. is going to start to get boring. Okay, <laughs> you are hearing the wrap-up of the uh, news conference that we just saw, a full update on Dr. Rick Saker, the Ebola patient. That's right. He has been in the Nebraska Medical Center's biocontainment unit since Friday, and they say he is improving now. They say in good condition. An experimental drug is being used to treat Dr. Dr. Sacra. At this point, doctors are not naming it. There's no data on it. It is very experimental. He is tolerating each dose better, they say. He also received two doses of a serum, a convalescent serum, from an Ebola survivor, Dr. Kent Brantley, who was also in Africa treating patients, also Dr. Sacra's friend. Now, doctors say he has been gravely helpful in telling them what symptoms he had and went greatly helpful, rather, in telling him what symptoms he had, when he had those symptoms, using his knowledge as a physician trying to relay how all of this happened and when. Now, they admit, though, they are guarded in the progress he's made, but hopeful at this point. And Sacra's wife, uh, Sacra's wife, Debbie, uh, emotional at some times. You see here the shot that we saw yesterday released by Nebraska Medical Center of her reading Bible verses to her husband, Rick. She said today that she was reading Psalm 20 and John 14. She picked those out. Those are basically assurances uh, from the Lord to his disciples, saying that there is strength and there is life. And she said that they relied upon that. And she said, quote, just moments ago, quote, we thank God for Rick's life. She said that Rick says this is not about him. It's about getting the job done. And then he would want all the focus to be on what's happening in Liberia. She said when he left in early August, they addressed their worst fears. But she said she knew where his heart was and that he loves the people of Liberia. His Ebola infection happened during an emergency situation at a clinic in Liberia. The CDC is investigating that. We have not heard how exactly he got infected. She expects that her husband will want to go back to Liberia. She attributes his recovery to faith and to science. 
and hopes what he's what's learned by this will help with the treatment in West Africa, where she says again that the focus should be. She says this will give her husband a platform to help others. Now, doctors at the Nebraska Medical Center continue to monitor his condition, assess his, his condition every day. They said at this point it's not clear how long he'll be in the biocontainment unit or in the hospital in general. There are strict CDC guidelines. They have to run two tests 48 hours apart to ensure that the Ebola virus is no longer in his blood. And because the information is so limited on patients, they say he's very different than the doctors who were at Emory. He's very different than any of the patients in Africa. They're not sure how long this will take, but again, they stress he is in good condition right now, and they have a lot of hope that he will not go through a relapse or this honeymoon phase that they have seen in other patients in Africa. Again, we're com compiling all of what the doctor said, as well as Debbie Sacra, Rick Sacra's wife. We're going to have that for you tonight at 5, 6, and 10, as well as at KETV.com. For now, let's go back to regular programming.